happy Mother's Day. What a great day it is. Everybody that's got a mother, raise your hand. Okay, good. We don't have any aliens here, that's good. Although aliens would be welcome, I guess. Um, uh, we just don't have a box to check on our guest card for alien. So um, Today we are continuing with our Questions of Jesus sermon series that we've been doing. Um, we're going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Today the question is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Now, this is the perfect Mother's Day question to me. I think my mom asked me this variation of this question growing up all my life, right? Son, do you love your sisters? Well, yes, Mom, I love my sisters. Then why are you always putting them in a headlock? Or those moments that you go to your mom, Mom, I love you. Oh, I love you, Mom. Well, why don't you clean your room? Those are questions that I've heard all my life, right? And your mom probably asked you a few of those questions too, those questions that, that you know that there's some meaning behind, that your mom's really trying to get to the root of the matter. Well, Jesus here is trying to get to the root of the matter in us. This question today uh, really deals with deeper issues than just, than just the, the surface here. He's, he's talking about real disciples versus counterfeit disciples. He's talking about obedience versus disobedience. He's getting to the deeper questions of the heart here. It may on the outside seem like a, a question of just works and, and why don't you do what I say, uh, but we need to understand the deeper part of this and how the Lord wants us to understand it. So let's go to the Word today. Luke chapter 6, verse 46 through the end of the chapter. And this is Jesus speaking. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my word, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against the house, and it couldn't shake it because it was well built. But with the one who hears and does not act like a man who built a house on the ground without a, hesit without a foundation, the river crashed against it, and immediately it was collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. Jesus here has been teaching, right? He's been teaching, teaching about what it means to be a real disciple, right? You go through the book of, of Luke, and he does this in Matthew chapter 6 and 7, but he's, he's given an idea of what it means to really follow him. He gives the, the Beatitudes in, in chapter 6 and verses 20 through 23, and he talks about being self-satisfied in verses 24 through 26 in chapter 6. And he goes on, he talks about loving your enemies and then how you're supposed to love uh, your, your neighbors, and he, and he speaks of hypocrisy. Right before he gets to this, this passage, he's talking about a, a good tree and, and what is real fruit bearing as a, as a believer. What does it mean to bear good fruit? And now he talks about obedience. Now, it's good if you're going to have followers to kind of give them a basis for what it means to follow, Right? If you're going to be a follower of Christ, it's good to know what in the world it looks like to be a follower of Christ. Jesus doesn't lead us out there and just say, figure it out on your own. He gives us his word and he shares with us here the very truth of what it means to have a good foundation in this world. You see, the, the question in verse 46 is kind of a loaded question. He gets to the point, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now, notice it's not just one Lord, right? Uh, what they did back in those days was if you were really a follower of somebody, you would double the word, right? I love you, mom, mom, okay? Double emphasis, right? He's talking about here, they would follow their teachers and they would be a disciple of their teacher, of their Lord. He would be the Lord over them. And they would follow him wherever he went. There weren't classrooms where you would go and learn all of these things. You would have somebody to follow, and you would follow them wherever they went, learned what they did, how they did things, what they said. You would take notes, right? That's how we, got, that's how we have the Scripture. 
Right? And so they are saying to him, Lord, Lord. What they're doing by that is they're saying, I've got extreme allegiance to you. I'm going to follow you to death and back, Jesus. I am dedicated to you. You are everything that I want. And he's saying, but why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you say that you love me so much and that you want to follow me, that I'm, that I'm all of that, but you don't do what I say? You see, it's a question we all need to ask. This foundation of being a disciple of Jesus is obedience. Doing what he wants us to do. Right? That's a very simple thing, but oftentimes we substitute with doing what he wants us to do with what we want to do instead. Right? We see here what, what he's saying. He says, verse 47, I will show you what someone is like. He's about to give them an illustration of what it's like. And understand, both of these illustrations that we see, one of the, with the deep dug foundation and the one that has no foundation, they both say that Jesus is Lord. Right? They both say that. They both have followed him all these places. They've, they've all you know, done some things that he's asked them to do, I'm sure. But overall, he's just saying, why do, you, why do you say that I'm your Lord, but you can't follow through? See, a lot of times we have a problem with follow through. We'll say we love the Lord all we can with our lips. But then when it comes down to the actual obedience, the actual walking with him, he, he tells us, if, if you love me, why don't you clean your room? And we're like, Lord, I love you, but I've got other things to do. You see, the Lord wants us to see this beautiful plan that he's got for us. It's not just enough to say, I love you, Jesus. Right? That's not, that's, and that's never enough just to say, I love you, Jesus. It is, I love you, Jesus, and I will follow you. You see, too many times people that have this profession, they say they love the Lord, but they don't walk with Him. They're missing out. They're cheating themselves. And when we cheat ourselves, when we as believers, we tell the Lord we love Him and we don't do what He says, and, and we're cheating not so much the Lord, we're cheating ourselves too at the same time. It's a double mess that we put ourselves into, really. You see, Christ is the foundation of all that we need. And as a disciple of His, we are called to, to go to the next level, to walk with Him and to, to talk with Him, to know that He's always there with us. Well, let's understand what He's saying here. We've got some background. Let's look at the two pictures here. The first of all, the firm foundation. Verse 47, He says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me hears my words, and acts on them. Here he's basically given us a description first of a disciple, right? Somebody who has come to him, who has put their faith in the Lord. They have come to him first of all, right? We all have to come to Christ at some point in our faith, right? If you don't ever come to Christ, then you don't have the faith in the Lord. And he's saying, you've come to me, you hear my words, and that's continually hear his words, and then we act on them. And that's what he's talking about here. This, this firm foundation is a disciple that says, hey, Lord, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to come to you consistently. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read your word because your word is, is, is life to me. And then, Lord, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And that's what uh, uh, he's given the, the recipe right here. In verse 48, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. He's saying that a true disciple is like a builder. He's got the blueprints, right? He knows this is where I need to build. He's got the land laid out, and he knows exactly the consistency of the land. He knows what kind of soil it is. And this builder looks at everything, and, and he says, you know, if I'm going to have a house that's going to last, I've got to build down deep. And so it says that he dug down deep, and he put the foundation deep, not upon the, the soil that moves, uh, but upon the rock, the rock that will never shift. I, I don't know if you've had or ever had cracks in your house, right? Where back in Texas, where I was from before here, we had, we had a lot of these companies that made a whole lot of money because people's soil would sink 
And half the house would go down, and they would come in and dig under the house, and, and they would dig deep, and they would set these pilings, and they would go down deep, and they would, they would jack up the house, and then fill in everything else and make the house level. Well, here he sees that in advance. He says, I realize that if I don't dig down deep, then my house is going to at some point rock. It's going to sometime dip, and sometimes there's going to be cracks through my house. And so this builder is taking everything to account. Now, the, the blueprints that he follows are the blueprints that Christ gives him. You see, we need to realize that Christ, the, the creator of all things, has laid out the blueprints for how we should live. Right? He, he outlines everything for us right here. How, how, we should, how should we should relate to each other. How we should treat our husbands and wives. How we should love our kids. How we should do interaction in the neighborhood. What should we live and how should we live? That's the blueprints for our life. A lot of people don't like the word because it doesn't say things that they like, but we can't really go against that in many ways because he knows us, he's created us, and he's got the best design and the best plan for us. Sometimes we'll look at the blueprints and I don't like those, God, he says, but it's the best thing for you. You see, this builder lays it all out. He digs down deep and he lays the foundation on the rock. Now, how is his building shown as worthy? Well, here comes the river. It's flood stage. It washes over his house. And after the flood waters go down, guess what? His house is still there. His house is still there. He had some great riverfront property. He took care of the house. He did everything that he needed. And when the, when the floods came, everything was found just right. You see, as we as uh, people, everybody on this earth faces floods and storms, right? That's nothing that we're immune from. Uh, you believe in Christ, you're going to have troubles. You don't believe in Christ, you're going to have troubles. But the difference between those who believe in Christ and have faith in Him, when they experience trouble, it's experiencing trouble differently than those who have no faith because those who have no faith have nowhere to look. Those of us who are in faith in Christ have only one place to look, the foundation, the true rock which we're built upon. You see, each of us, if, you haven't, if you're not in the middle of a storm, I had an old uh, mentor one time, he said, Son, I said, if you're not in a storm, you're coming out of a storm or you're going into a storm. One of the two. And if you've experienced that, that's the truth, right? Yeah, everything's going great for a while. The water's calm. It's a beautiful day. The sun's shining. The birds are chirping. And then all of a sudden, here comes a storm. And God gets you through that storm, and then you've got the calm. You see, each one of us are going to have a storm. Maybe you're in a storm right now. Maybe there's a storm brewing in your family. Maybe there's a storm at work or, or in your health. There's a storm that, that, that's about to happen. You foresee it happening. Maybe you've got that uneasy feeling that something's about to happen. Anybody ever get that besides me? It usually happens on Mondays for some reason. <laughs> something's going to happen. I better get to praying, God, because I feel like something's going to happen this week. And then you know what? After I pray, nothing happens. I think there's a connection there somehow. But we see here this builder. He chooses the right materials. Right, if you're going to build a house, you don't want to build a gingerbread house. Uh, can I get an amen somewhere? Amen. You know, you're going to build this big, beautiful house. You don't want to build it out of clay. You don't want to build it out of ginger. It would be pretty. I mean, it'd be full. Of, it'd be beautiful. I mean, this 3,000 square foot gingerbread house, man, that'd be beautiful. Invite friends over. We're going to eat the dining room tonight. <laughs> right, but you see, that wouldn't be a very good house to live in now, would it? I mean, you'd have ants, you'd have to be spraying ants all the time. And the building material matters. How we build our lives, the way that we live our lives, the, the way that we build every brick upon brick in our lives and in everything that we're a part of matters on what kind of material we use. You see, too many people today build their houses with materials that don't last. There's a lot of people that we know that we can point to that they've, they're building in these mansions that are just eaten up very quickly. They build their lives on foundations, not of, of concrete and not upon the rock, but they build their lives on, on popularity or, or health or, or 
work or, or money or whatever it may be, and then those foundations all fail because we all become unpopular. We all don't get any prettier. I mean, you don't have to give an amen there, but we can just acknowledge that secretly as friends. Right? And, and, and we, we get less money over there. I mean, you just see what I'm saying. All of these things that we can build our lives on, the materials are not any good other than building upon the rock of Christ. And he's trying to help us understand here that this real disciple, he is the foundation that is building everything upon Christ. He dug down deep. He got to the rock. He laid the foundation. And when everything came, it stood the test of the storm. Let me ask you a little personal question. The last storm you had, how did your house weather? You don't have to answer, but just answer it in your heart. The last storm that you had, it may be health, it may be family, it may be all kinds of drama, whatever it may be, but how did you handle the last storm that came through your life? Now, it's going to happen. You get a storm through your life, and all the backyard furniture is strode everywhere, and you got a tree down maybe, and you got things you got to pick up. Now, that all happens in our life, but did the structure of your life stay put? Did you question whether or not God was good? Did you yell out at God, say, you're a rascal? You stink, God, for letting me go through this? Or how did you react in the midst of the storm? You see, how you react in the midst of the storm shows where your foundation is laid. You see, we can replace stuff, right? We can replace stuff very easily. But you can't replace the real stuff in life. The family relationships, the, the love and the care. You can't replace the hugs and the tenderness. You can't replace the friendships and, and the sons and daughters and the granddaughters and the grandsons. You can't replace those kind of things. Everything else can go away. But you see, it's the foundation of this world that if we build it upon Christ, the storms will come. But we'll stand strong in Him. That's the way it works. You go on here, and he talks about those that don't build it are going to have a problem. You see, the Bible talks all through Scripture about being those that follow the Lord. James 1.22 says to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Let me give you just a quick litmus test, okay? This is for all of us. After you leave on Sunday, after the message, do you remember anything a couple of days later? You can be honest. You don't have to tell me out loud. I don't need an email saying, I don't remember a thing at 12.01, Pastor. You know, about 11, 11.30, I'm good, I'm locked in. 12.02, that hard drive dumps, Okay? Everything's erased, and I, don't, I, don't, I just don't remember a thing. Okay, now if you do that, then you need to work on your hard drive. Okay, you need some hard drive work. Because we come and we open the Word in small group and in, in service here, and we sing, a song, sing songs that are full of Scripture. And those things, God brings, and we don't realize this a lot of times, God's bringing you here today to worship Him so that He can fill you with His goodness so that you're prepared for the week to come. You see, how many of us today know exactly what's going to happen on Thursday? None of us. How many of us know what's going to happen tomorrow? None of us. But you see, the Lord is the Lord of all time. And He sees what's going to happen this week in your life. And because of His love and His care and His tenderness for you, and His wanting to, to see you flourish and get through everything, He says, come worship me. I will prepare you for what's about to come into your life. But don't forget about it when you leave the doors. You see, if you come and just listen, and then you leave, and the Word of God leaves you, then you are, you are just hearing the Word only. God wants us to be doers of the Word. Great story. There was one of our missionaries in Korea. He had led, I mean, hundreds of, of Koreans, South Koreans to Christ. One of the young men... Uh, moved hours away, 
Well, years later, the young man makes his way hours away on a bicycle and comes and knocks on our missionary's door. And he says, I've learned scripture and I want to recite them for you. The missionary was so excited. He said, oh, great. And so he comes in and this young man had memorized huge portions of the book of Matthew. And he recites the scriptures to him just perfectly, verbatim, and beautifully. And the missionary was just amazed at this young man. And of course, being the missionary that he was, he says, now, he said, let me remind you. He said, it's good to know the word, and it's good to, 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 to be able to memorize the word, but he said, the goal is to be able to do the word. And he says, I, I want you to take all that you've memorized, and he said, I want you to do it. And he stopped him, he said, sir, he said, I want you to know that I've already done that. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, I started trying to memorize the scripture and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't sit. I couldn't remember it. And he said, so what I did, the Lord led me as I prayed, said, well, what I would do is I would memorize one scripture on one day and then I would go out and do that scripture the next day. He said, once I started to do that, it was easy to memorize the scripture. What this young man was saying, that everything that he had memorized, he had already done. Loving his neighbor, providing, caring, gentleness, tenderness to the people around him. You see, we as the believers in Christ, we need to not just hear the word, but we need to do the word. We need to be obedient to Christ. You look at the front of your bulletin, if you've got a bulletin. Those things on the front of your bulletin, those are just some of the things... That Christ asks us to do. God asks us to do in our lives. It's not a comprehensive list. But it's a good start. Let me ask you today. Are you just hearing the word of God and not applying it? Are you not living it? Because we all need to live the word of God. Living the word is like a man who digs down deep. He sets the foundation of the house upon the rock. He builds everything to spec with the best of the building materials. And then when the storm comes, he sits back with calm and peace in his house, knowing that nothing can overcome what God has built. Amen. The next thing that we see, unfortunately, is the one who builds without the foundation. Verse 49, but the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and the destruction of that house was great. You see, this is the idea of a disciple. He's been with Jesus. He's heard what he said, but he goes away and he doesn't do anything of what Christ said. Right, he's just been giving him lip service. He says, you know, he said, you love me with your words, but your heart's far from me. And he says, they're the ones that when the river comes against it, immediately it collapsed and the destruction was great. You see, if a, a, a false disciple is one who hears what God says, but, you know, he just ignores it. You know, I know that there's a plan for my life, God, but I just don't want to be a part of that i got other plans, God, that are better than yours. Right? Many of us will, the Lord will ask us to do something, but we're, we've got this one excuse that I think is just, it's, it's losing water more and more, is that we're just too busy. I've heard that over and over. I'm just too busy to do this, and I'm too busy to do that. Well, if you're too busy for the Lord, you're too busy. Simple as that. I found over the years, too, that the things that we want are the things we'll spend time on. The things we want to do are the things that we will schedule in our time. The things that are important to us are the things that we will make sure happen. Right? Those things that are back on the fringe, we can just go past all that. God, I've got a better plan. I I can, you know, I I just don't know, Lord. I I don't like your plan. How many of us have said that to God at some point or another? Amen. You see, God wants us to to be the one who digs down deep. Now, as a disciple that that doesn't listen, a false disciple, often we don't think about the consequences of what happens. Right? Too many times we as people in this world, we only think from day to day. 
I've just got to get through Monday, God. And then I've just got to get through Tuesday. And before you know it, it's 30 years later. Your life is the same, but you have survived by the grace of God somehow. But there's been no real good change in your life. You've not grown in Christ. You've not done anything for the kingdom that's going to last beyond your years on this earth. And you turn around. You're in a nursing home. Nobody comes to see you because you've been too busy to talk to anybody ever. And so they don't mind that you're there. Uh, your, your funeral, if you could see your funeral from heaven or from where else, and nobody's there, it's because you might have been too busy to do everything else but do the real things of life. You see, we can never be too busy for God. We can never be people that, that would rather do stuff here than to be with the people of God and to love and to care and to share the love of God with all those around us. You see, if we live this life, we're missing the critical point if we just live it on the surface level. You see, God wants deeper, more powerful, more wonderful things for us than we could ever imagine. And see, when God tells us how to build, now understand, he says here, the one who hears, this guy, this false disciple, he heard it also. He heard the same stuff that the other guy heard. He was in the same meeting. They got the same plans. But this one guy says, I'm going to build it right. And the other guy says, I don't care. Many times this guy here, this false one, doesn't want to do it because it takes effort. It takes time. You can't just learn everything about the Lord in one Sunday. I mean, you ever realize that? You want to, get, you want to know the Lord. You want, Lord, show me all this stuff. But it takes a lifetime to know the Lord. And he often doesn't do anything but just day to day. He can't teach me anything tomorrow. He can't teach me anything yesterday. He's got to teach me today. And I've got to open my eyes and my ears and listen for what he wants to happen in my life. You see, you hear all this stuff and you don't do anything. Then you see what happens. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. He adds this on for emphasis. And the destruction of that house was great. The destruction of that house was great. You see, when we live a life apart from Christ and we build our lives on just the surface level of this earth, what we can have, you know, what we've got, you know, simple things, right? If we just build it on the surface, then this life is going to be destroyed pretty quickly. If we build it on people, if we build it on this, if we build it on our intelligence or success or this, it's all going to come crashing down. And God does that in mercy. You realize that. He sends these storms in our lives to remind us that you're not built on Him. You're built on you. So a lot of times we need to, when we get out of the storm, we need to thank God for those storms. Because He redirects us and realigns us with the building again. When everything's destroyed, he gives us back those plans again. He asks him to ask us to roll them out. This is what I have for you. This is far greater than you can build on your own. This will give you joy and peace and love, things more abundant than you can imagine. Build on it this time. We just got to obey. We've got to get back and just be his. Now, we need to notice something here because... In Matthew chapter 7, the kind of equivalent passage here, Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, here Jesus is in the same, the same instance, right? Matthew records extra words, more words than Luke does, okay? Now, Matthew records Jesus going on this conversation and saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, on that day many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Now it seems like a contradiction. Right? In, in Luke he says, you need to obey my word. And then in Matthew, we see that there was people that supposedly obeyed, but Jesus says that wasn't good enough. So what's he talking about here? Well, let's understand, he's talking about the heart. 
Why do you do what you do? That's where it all comes down. What is your motivation in this life? Why do you follow the Lord or why do you not follow the Lord? It's an issue of the heart. You see, sometimes we get this whole thing screwed up, right? We think that, okay, if I obey God, then he will bless me. Okay, and that's, that, that, let me just tell you, that's messed up theology. Okay, it's totally messed up. Because we need to understand it in this way. God has already blessed me immensely. So thus I get to obey and I want to obey. You see, that's the right understanding. If you serve the Lord just to get something back from God that's wrong, just stop it. I think that's the example of these people here in Matthew 7. They did all these great things, but Jesus says... You did that stuff, but I don't even know you. He's saying that there was no relationship with Jesus. There was no knowledge of a Savior and a sinner that has come together and and they had their sins forgiven by Him. He's saying, it doesn't matter what you do if you don't know me. But then when you know me, then you can understand what I want you to do. Sometimes we can be legalist. There was a great quote from a book I read recently. It says, the essence of legalism is trusting in religious activity rather than trusting in God. It's putting our confidence in the practice rather than in the person of Jesus. And without fail, this will lead us to love the practice more than it will loving the Savior. You see, let me just say something. Sometimes it can be boring being a Christian. You just go to church, you get up, you put your clothes on, you get in the car, you come up here. Afterwards, you go do whatever you did before, and then it's just like that old commercial, you rinse and repeat. You see, if your relationship with Christ ever gets to that point of just vain repetition, then you become a legalist. You've become a religious person. You're not coming because you have a desire to know the Lord or be with the Lord's people, to learn His Word. You've come to check the box. Jesus doesn't care about what box you check. The only box that He wants us to check is that we know Him. That's the most essential box that we check. Now, let me give you some Another litmus test. Do you get in the Word consistently during the week? And if you don't get in the Word consistently in the week, why not? This is life to us. It is the very Word of God. This will help us to live. It will help us show us lead us how to construct that spiritual house that we are to live in here and forever. But let me tell you, don't go home tomorrow and check a box. Oh, I've got to do it. The preacher said I've got to do it. But let me tell you, there is something called self-control to where we, even when we don't feel like it, we get in the Word because God will always meet us in His Word. If you don't attend worship, why not? Are there better things to do? You see, we have to ask those hard questions because God doesn't want us to be legalists. He wants us to be gracists, full of His grace and His mercy, living with Him on a daily basis with all of our warts, with all of our problems. Now understand, when we come to know Christ, it doesn't mean that we stop disobeying Him. We still have to deal with this flesh suit that we've got to deal with until we leave this place. But it is only in that Time with the Lord in His Word and in prayer, talking to our Heavenly Father, that He changes us. He changes our motives from having to serve the Lord to getting to serve the Lord. From having to do this to getting to do this. There's a big change. You know how kids are. 
Wouldn't it be great if all of our kids got up one day and says, I want to clean my room because I am so thankful, mom and dad, or mom or dad, for, for what you've done for me. Oh, wouldn't that be great? That would fill our hearts with joy. But you know what? I think God feels the same way. He provides for us. He takes care of us. He gives us everything we need and more. He just gave you that breath and that heartbeat you just had. And he would rather us come to the Lord. God, I want to serve you, God. I want to go to church because I want to worship you and be with the wonderful people you've, you've, you've got for the kingdom. Oh, God, I want to be a part of a small group Bible study so that I can learn more about you. Oh, God, I want to be on the prayer list so that I can pray for my friends and family and the people in the church. Oh, God, I want to, I want to serve you and do these things because you've given me so much. Oh, and Father in heaven, his heart just beams. Because that's when we start to get it. He doesn't want a bunch of complaining children that says, Oh God, i got to go back to church again. i got to go listen to that music. I've got to go pretend like I've got it figured out. God doesn't want that from us. He wants us to be real with Him. He wants us to have our foundation set on the rock which is him. You see, we come here today, and it's a great day. It's a Mother's Day, and it's a wonderful day. And we've got a great scripture of just things my mother has said to me over the years. But you see, Jesus wants more because he has more to offer. As much as I love my mom and as great a job as she did putting up with me and not killing me before I became of age, you know, it was because God's grace in her. I had a praying grandma that read scriptures to me and told me about Jesus. I'll see her again. She's with Jesus right now. You see, we don't want to miss the big picture of this whole thing. The whole thing is we need Christ. We are sinners, every one of us. We are separated from God. Our sin takes us far from God. And the only way is the bridge of the cross that Christ died on for us. When he died on the cross and his blood was shed, he was the sacrifice that we all need for our sin. When we put our faith in him and we believe in Christ that he is the Son of God, that he is the very creator of all things, that his sacrifice makes us clean. When we believe in him, he changes us. He forgives us of all of our sins. Past, present, and future, thank the Lord. And then not only that, he gives us the blueprints. Here you go, son. Here you go, girl. This is what I want you to follow. Just follow me day by day. And then he walks with us. We get to talk to the creator of all things. I mean, just imagine that. We don't even get to talk to the president or state senators. We don't get to talk to the, we get to talk to the creator of everything anytime we want. Wow. That's awesome. And that was done because the cross at Calvary. It stopped the separation between God and man. It ushered us in as we put our faith in Christ into the throne room to says you are sons and daughters of God. Wow. Today, if you don't know the Lord, I invite you to come and we will lead you to him. We can't do it for you. You can't be a Christian because your mama was or your daddy was. You can't be a Christian because you just sit in church. It means that we have to believe in him. We have to take him at his word and say, God, forgive me of my sin. I'm yours. Maybe today you've never been baptized. You've put your faith in the Lord, but you've never been baptized. Come and we will we'll talk to you about that. Whatever it is today, God brought you here for a reason. It's not by mistake that he brought you here. Remember I told you earlier, he wants you to have a great time with him this week. He's got your, your week planned. He brought you here today to prepare you for that. So today, listen, hear, and obey.
maybe as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are too busy. We put everything out there. We forget to put the Lord here. During this invitation today, I just invite you just to talk to him. The very creator of all things. Say, God, forgive me for building on something else but you. God, forgive me for spending more time doing this or doing that instead of being with you. And then he'll write, he'll come in and inspect your house, reorient some things, rehang up some beautiful pictures that he's painted just for you. He puts your face on his refrigerator. That's what our God has for us. Let's pray together. Then after we pray, I just ask you to obey. Let's pray together. God, you're awesome. Just the the great love that you have for us, Lord, giving us everything that we need in abundance, taking care of us, Lord, showing us a love, Lord, that is not of this world, but a Lord, uh, just a lording presence and love that you give us, Father, that extends past everything. Lord, I pray today, if somebody doesn't know you, that they will today. They will experience the grace and the mercy, Lord, that, that you offer us. As brothers and sisters, Lord, I ask that you help us to walk with you, to be obedient. Lord, you're awesome. Take this time, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.